Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Continuing with Zad al-Mustaqna of Imam al-Hajjawi. Uh, we're in the chapter where the Imam, he said, Kitab al-Tatawwa, Salat al-Tatawwa. And we mentioned that these uh, prayers that the author is speaking about are prayers that are supererogatory prayers, prayers that are non-obligatory. And we left off last week after speaking about Tarawih and Witr and such issues. We're joining now again the author where he says, Thumma as-sunan ar-ratiba. Then the sunan which are ratiba. So when the author mentions a sunan ar-ratiba, he means by these sunan, those which are continual sunnas that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always do. They are highly stressed. They are, most, they are the most stressed out of all the optional prayers. And they are connected to the faraid. They are connected to the obligatory prayers. So they are very important. Um, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about them that a person who leaves this off, these prayers off regularly and intentionally, then this person is an evil person and the testimony of that person shouldn't be accepted, showing in the light, in the eyes of this great Imam, how important these sunan are. So the author, he mentions rak'atani qabla dhuhr, two before dhuhr, wa rak'atani ba'daha, and two after dhuhr, wa rak'atani ba'da al-maghrib, and two after maghrib, wa rak'atani ba'da al-isha, and two after isha, wa rak'atani qabla al-fajr, and two before fajr. So these, according to the official famous opinion of the madhab, are the sunan al-rawatib, the stressed and sunan al-mu'akkada. So in Bukhari and Muslim, Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, in Bukhari, Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, he said, حَفِظْتُمْ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم عشر ركعات. He said, I memorized from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ten raka'at of extra supererogatory prayers, which are sunnah al rawatib He said, رَقْعَتَانِ قَبْلَ الظُّهْرِ Two before dhuhr, وَرَقْعَتَانِ بَعْدَهَا And two after dhuhr. وَرَقْعَتَانِ بَعْدَ الْمَغْرِبِ فِي بَيْتِهِ And two raka'at, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would do after maghrib in his house. وَرَقْعَتَانِ بَعْدَ الْإِشَاءِ فِي بَيْتِهِ And two, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would do after isha likewise, in his house. وَرَقْعَتَانِ قَبْلَ الصلاة الصبح and two raka'at before the uh, Fajr prayers. And with this, you have a total of 10 raka'at, which are sunan ar-rawatiba, sunan which are stressed. So wherein the author mentioned that two before Fajr, raka'atani qabla fajr wa huma akaduhuma, wa huma akaduha, that the two before Fajr are the most stressed of these sunan ar-rawatiba, of these uh, stressed sunan prayers. Because Aisha radiallahu anha, as in Sahih Muslim, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Rak'at al-Fajr khayrun min al-dunya wa ma fiha. That these two sunan raka'at that you pray before Fajr are better than the world and all that it contains, subhanAllah. Such huge and immense rewards contained in just two raka'at before Salat al-Fajr. So it's imperative that we don't leave them off. And in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, it's mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, was not found to be more committed to anything from the extra prayers more so than the two raka'at or fajr. So these are extremely important prayers. Now, there are some sunnah pertaining to the um, fajr sunnah prayers, the two sunnah before fajr. Uh, from the sunnah, Number one is to keep them short in length. And uh, of course, short in length doesn't mean that you pray them without having tumma'nina and without having khushu. But in Bukhari and Muslim, it's narrated that Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Kana and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yukhafifu raka'atayni qabla salat al-subh hatta inni la'aqool hal qara'a fihi ma bi umm al-Qur'an. That Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would pray these two raka'at before Fajr very quickly and very in a very light manner to the extent that I would say to myself, has the Prophet ﷺ recited therein Surat Al-Fatiha? Meaning they were so quick in the eyes of Ahmad Aisha that she would wonder had the Prophet ﷺ even recited Surat Al-Fatiha. The second of the sunan pertaining to these two raka'at, the sunan of Fajr, 
is that what's recited in these two raka'at is قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ in the first raka'at and in the second raka'at you recite قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ the third of the uh, sunnah pertaining to these raka'at is that they should be prayed in the house they should be prayed in the house as the majority of these sunnah that we are speaking about in fact should be prayed in the house where possible and the fourth pertaining to the fourth sunnah here to be mentioned is that the person makes uh, is that the person lays down on their right side after having prayed uh, these sunnah prayers for a short while before they get up to go and pray the fad salah the author may Allah have mercy upon him he said one man fatahu shay'un minha sunnah lahu qada'uhu whoever misses out anything from these 10 raka'at, these 10 extra stressed rawatib sunnah, then it's uh, it's sunnah or it's recommended for this person to make up these prayers that he has missed. Because in Bukhari and Muslim, in the hadith of Anas, the Prophet said, Man nama anis salah, man nasya salatan, aw nama anha, fal yusalliha, fa kafaratuha, an yusalliha idha dhakaraha. The Prophet وسلم, said in this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, reported by Anas, that whoever forgets a prayer or sleeps over a prayer, then the expiation of that is to pray them when he or she remembers them. So you notice in the hadith that salah, the word salah is makira, it's general. And it's mentioned in the context of siyaq uh, al for those of you who understand Arabic. And this means that it's referring to any type of salah. The salah that is missed is not only the obligatory salah that has to be made up, it's any type of salah. Uh, therefore, the ulama, they said that the uh, stressed salat, the sunan al-rawatib, also fall into this category. That if they are missed, they should be made up, or they can be made up. And also in Tirmidhi, Abu Huraira relates from the Prophet ﷺ who said, مَنْ لَمْ يُسَلِّ رَكْعَةَ يَلْفَجَرِ فَلْيُسَلِّهِمَا بَعْدَنَا تَطْلَعَ الشَّمْسِ That whoever didn't pray the two raka'at of Fajr, then he should pray them or she should pray them after the sun has risen, meaning after the prohibited time has gone. So here's a question to yourselves that was posed by some of the scholars when explaining this book. They said, is there a qaid, is there a restriction here, a qaid, regarding who makes up these salawat? Are they made up in all situations and by every person? Or is there a particular restriction in the understanding of who and when they are made up? As mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al he mentioned that if a person is known not to pray these regularly, the sunan al-rawatib, then this person cannot make them up. But it's referring to a person who habitually prays them and when they miss them out for whatever reason, uh, then this person is allowed to make them up. So it doesn't apply to somebody who is not from their habit to uh, pray the sunan al-rawatib. And also the Shaykh of the Salam al-Shawair, he mentioned that these uh, rawatib are not to be prayed, not to be prayed in the forbidden times, not to be made up in the forbidden times. So for example, if somebody misses the sunnah of fajr, then they have to wait until the sun has risen, uh, has fully risen, uh, after sunrise for around 15 minutes, then they can make up the salawat. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, well, salatu layl afdal min salat al nahar that the night prayers are better, the prayers in the night are better than the prayers in the day. This is understood from a variety of hadith from the Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abu Huraira, where the Prophet said, afdal salat ba'tu salat al maktuba as salatu fi jawfi layl that the best prayer after the obligatory prayers is the prayer in the middle of the night, in the depths of the night, the night prayer. But the ulama, the scholars, they explain that this is not ala itlaqihi, is not unrestricted, okay? What it's referring to here, that the night prayer is better than all those prayers which are nafal al-mutlaq. Nafal al-mutlaq are nafal prayers which are unrestricted. They're not tied to a cause or a reason. So for example, the 10 raka'at that we mentioned before, they are tied to a reason, they are tied to the obligatory prayer. So the night prayer is not better than those prayers, nor is the night prayer better than the Salat al-Kusuf, for example, the solar eclipse prayer, because that is tied to a reason. 
So what's being referred to here, that the night prayer is better than all other prayers during the day, are those prayers which are nawafil al-mutlaq, are um, open and unrestricted nawafil, not tied to a reason and not tied to another obligatory prayer. Okay, but if the prayer is from that which is known as Dat al-Asbab, then the night prayer is not better than those. The author, he said, وَأَفْضَلُهَا ثُلُثُ اللَّيْلِ بَعْدَ نِسْفِهِ And the best time to pray the night prayer is the third of the night after half of the night has passed. So this is taken from the understanding in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّ أَحَبَّ الصِّيَامِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى صِيَامُ الدَّوُودِ وَأَحَبُّ الصَّلَاةِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى صَلَاةُ الدَّوُودِ that the most beloved fasting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. And the most beloved prayer to Allah azawajal is the prayer of Dawood alayhi salam. Kana yanamu nisful layl wa yusalli fulathuhu wa yanamu sudusuhu. The hadith says that the Prophet Dawood, he used to pray for half of the night. And then he would get up for a third of the night and then again he would sleep for the last sixth of the night. وَكَانَ يَسُومُ يَوْمًا وَيُفْتِرُ يَوْمًا And he, alayhi salatu salam, fast for a day and break his fast for a day. So here, the Sheikh uh, Ahmed Khalil, for example, he mentions that you take the time from Maghrib until Salat al-Fajr, okay? And you divide this into six parts. So the first three parts are for sleeping. The first three sixths of that night from Maghrib until Fajr are for sleeping. And then the next two sixths would be for praying. And then the last sixth again for going back to sleep. And also a point to mention here that we said that the time starts from Maghrib. Many of the companions, radiallahu anhum, they would pray between Maghrib and Isha and they would consider this as being part of Qiyam al -Layl. So to them it was a virtuous time to pray between Maghrib and Isha, Nafal Mutlaq, open Nafal. <coughs> Excuse me. The author he says, وَصَلَاةُ لَيْلٍ وَنَهَارٍ مَثْنَ مَثْنَ That the night prayer and the prayers in the day, meaning the Sunan prayers or the Nafal al Mutlaq in the day or night, are to be prayed in pairs, two by two. And this is because in Bukhari and Muslim, and a rajul and sa'ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and salatil layl. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him about the night prayer. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said salatul layl mathnan mathna. That the night prayer is in pairs. Two raka'ah then two raka'ah. Fa'idha khashi'a ahadukum musub salla raka'atan wahidatan tutiru lahu ma qad salla. And if one of you fear that the dawn is about to come upon him, that the fajr prayer is about to come upon him, then he prays one raka'ah which will make all of what he prayed before odd, make all of what he prayed before with the, And with regards to, so that's a clear evidence for praying two by two in the night prayers. With regards to praying two by two in the day prayers, um, Sheikh Mansour Saqub, he mentions the following. He says that it was never narrated authentically from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or from the companions, except that they would pray two by two. أن صلاة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وتطوعه بالنهار كله مثنى مثنى ولم ينقل عنه بسند الصحيح خلاف ذلك. The Sheikh he said. So it's never narrated from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or the companions authentically that they would pray uh, other than two by two during the day. And also he mentions وأن ابن عمر راوي الحديث الصابع كان يفتي بأن صلاة الليل والنهار مثنى مثنى يسلم في كل رقعتين وهو رأي الحديث ويعلم مخرجه. That the the narrator, the Rawi, the narrator of that hadith that we just mentioned previously about praying two by two in the night was Ibn Umar. And Ibn Umar himself used to give fatwa that the prayers in the day, during the day, should be done in pairs of two, two by two. So this shows you that he understood better because he's the narrator of the hadith which mentions to pray two by two. And his, his fatwa was that even during the day, one should pray two by two. And as we said, these points were mentioned by Sheikh Mansur in his uh, explanation of Zadim Mustaqlil. The author, he says, وَإِن تَطَوَّعَ فِي النَّهَارِ بِأَرْبَعِكَ الظُّهْرِ فَلَا بَعْسِ The author, he says, however, 
after having established that the sunnah is to pray two by two, whether that be in the night or that be in the daytime. However, if a person was to pray four raka'at, like they do for Salat al dhuhr then this is not uh, this is not uh, makroom, but it's khilaf al awla. It's uh, against that which is better. So we don't hold it to be makroom, but it's against that which is better. That which is better is to do two by two, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al The author he says, وَأَجُوا صَلَاتِ قَائِدٍ عَلَى نِسْفِ أَجُوا صَلَاتِ قَائِمٍ that the one who prays these summan prayers or nafil prayers whilst sitting down, then that person will get half of the reward, uh, half of the reward of the one who prays standing. Now, question to yourselves, is there a situation or is there a reason wherein one will pray sitting down, yet still get the full reward? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum <clears throat> Would it be maybe when they're traveling? In, uh, on the journey. Okay, Barakallah Fik Mela reward you. Good try, but that's not the answer. The Prophet وسلم, in Bukhari he mentioned that either Marid al Abd or Safara Kutibalahuma Kana Yatmanu uh Sahihan Mukiman or Mukiman Sahihan. That the slave, the Prophet وسلم, mentioned in the hadith in Bukhari that this, the worship of Allah is Wajal, if he's on a journey, okay. Oh, actually, you mentioned Jen. Yes, you were correct. If he's if he's sick, that was in my mind. If the person is sick, if the person is sick or he's on a journey, and then uh, the person is unable to do the acts of worship in the way that he normally would, then the person is still rewarded as if he was resident and is as if he was in a state of well-being. So, if you are sick, for example, and you are unable to stand up, yet habitually you would normally pray standing up, then you would still be rewarded. Uh, the same reward uh, as praying standing up. But in all other cases, if the person prays the nafil and the sunnah praying sitting down, then the person gets half of the reward. The author, he says, From the things which are recommended to pray during the day is salat al uh, In Sahih Muslim, Abi Dhar, he narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, يُصْبِهُ عَلَى كُلِّ صُلَامَ مِنْ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً That the Prophet ﷺ said that every morning it becomes incumbent upon every one of you for each bone that he has in his body that the person has to offer sadaqah. And then the hadith said إِنَّ كُلَّ تَسْبِيحَةٍ صَدَقَةً Every tasbih saying subhanAllah is sadaqah. وَكُلَّ تَحْمِيدَةٍ صَدَقَةً And every saying alhamdulillah is sadaqah. وَكُلَّ and every saying La ilaha illallah is sadaqah. Wa kulla takbiratin sadaqah. And every saying Allahu Akbar is sadaqah. Wa amru bil ma'rufi sadaqah. And enjoining the good is sadaqah. Wa nahiyun anil munkar sadaqah. And to establish people from, to prevent people from doing that which is wrong is sadaqah. Wa yujzi'u min dhalika raq'ataini yarka'ahuma min al-duha. But suffices from all of these acts of worship is that a person prays two raka'at at the time of duha, as salat al duha. So it's a very bad prayer and it's something which is stressed to do. However, the mashhur opinion in the madhab, the famous opinion in the madhab, is that it shouldn't be done every single day. It should be done ghibban. Ghibban means that it should be done one day on and one day off. And from the evidences that they hold for this is in Bukhari and Muslim, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, مَا رَأَيْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُسَلِّ سُبْحَةَ الدُّحَى قَطْ I never saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ever pray the prayer of duha. So of course, it doesn't mean that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم never prayed it. It means that it's very unlikely that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم prayed it every day. Why? Because when the Prophet Sallallahu would take turns in the different houses of his different wives and it came to the time of Aisha's turn, she claims that she's never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray this. Therefore, it means that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wouldn't pray it every single day. So as the ulama of the madhab, they said that it's uh, the mashhur opinion, the famous opinion in the madhab is that it's prayed one day on and one day off. However, the second opinion, Abu Jutani in the Hanabila, the second opinion, and who used to have that it's recommended to pray every single day due to the um, 
virtues that I mentioned about this Salah in other ahadith and uh, also due to the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu advised some of the companions to do so, to pray it regularly. And this is uh, an opinion which is held in the Muqtab. The author, he says, وَأَقَلُّهَا The least of it, meaning Salat al-Duha, raka'atani, is two raka'at. Okay, وَأَكْثَرُهَا thaman, And the most of it is eight raka'at. وَوَقْتُهَا مِنْ خُرُوجِ الْوَقْتِ النَّهِي إِلَى قُبَيْلِ الزَّرْوَالِ and the time for praying this Salat al-Duha is from the time when the uh, forbidden time has finished, which is after the sun has risen, uh, to the extent of a spear, okay, above the horizon. And this is around 15 minutes after sunrise uh, until Ubayl Zawal, until just before Zawal time. Just before Zawal time is around 10 minutes before Zawal. Question to yourselves, what is the wild time? So the beginning time is 15 minutes after sunrise and the end time is about 10 minutes before the wild time. What is the wild time? Would it, uh, when the sun is at its zenith? That's correct. When the sun is at its zenith in the middle of the sky and when it moves from there, then it means that the time for Salat al-Dhuhr has come upon. Jazakallah khairan. So again, the time of Salat al-Duha is from after sunrise around 10 to 15 minutes to before the wild time around 10 minutes. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, Was sujood tilawati salatun. He said that sujood tilawa, the sujood which is done, the prostration which is done at some points of recitation in the Quran is a prayer, is salah. So the author, he says that this sujood is a salah. So what does that mean for us? A question to you. What was the significance of the author, author mentioning, rahimullah, that it's a salah? What does it mean to us that he has mentioned that it's a salah? That sujood tillah is salah. What is the significance of this? Now, That you would have to have uh, wudu. Asant, barakallahu feek. So by virtue of the fact that the uh, ulama of the madhab consider it to be a salah, it means that those conditions that are required for a normal salah uh, are required for this also, for the sujood tilawa. So you have to be facing the qibla, your awra has to be covered, you have to be in a state of wudu, etc. Right? So in Bukhari in Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضأ That none of your prayer are accepted if you've broken your wudu until you renew your wudu. Okay? So the ulama, they say, وَالسَّجُودْ جُزْءٌ مِنْ أَجْزَاءِ صَلَاءِ فَقِيسَ عَلَيْهَا That the uh, that, um, sujood is a portion of the salah. It's a part of the salah. So it's given Qiyas to have the same rulings as a normal Salah would have, as mentioned by Ahmed Khalil Hafizahullah in his explanation. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, from amongst those who hold another opinion in the Hanbali Madhab, they said, They said, They said, The prostration of Tilawa and the prostration of Shukr is not from the Salah. But he has said, they said rather it is just a normal sujood and its ruling is that of dua. The evidence for this, I'll tell you, is la salata, the hadith, liman lam yaqra'a bi fatihatil kitab. That there is no prayer for the one who does not recite the surat al fatiha. So they said, based off of this, we, we are supporting our opinion that sujood tilawa is not a salah. How did they come to this conclusion based off the hadith which I just mentioned to you? That there is no prayer for the one who doesn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So the hadith says, La salata liman lam kitab. There is no prayer for the one that doesn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So Ibn Taymiyyah, he's saying, look, this sajda tilawa is not a salah because in it, Surah Al-Fatiha is not read. And the hadith has just clearly stated that there is no salah for the one who doesn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So therefore, if you don't recite salah in the sajda, then how can it be a salah? So this was their evidence. However, as we said, the official 
opinion of the madhab is that sajda to tilawa and sajda to shukr is a salah. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he goes on and he says, Yusannu lil qari, that it's sunnah, however, it's not wajib, it's sunnah for the one who is reciting. In Bukhari Muslim, it's narrated that Zayd ibn Thabit qara'a ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam surah al najm wa lam yasjud fiha. That Zayd ibn Thabit in radiallahu anhu, he recited to the Prophet sallallahu in his presence, Surat al-Najm. And when it came to the prostration uh, where he should have prostrated for sujood al tilawa he didn't do so. Had it been obligatory, the Prophet sallallahu would have informed him, right? Because of the rule in fiqh, la taqir fi biyani waqt al haja or something to that effect. That is not allowed for the Prophet sallallahu to delay instructing that which needs to be instructed okay so had it been imperative uh, had it been wajib to have done so then the prophet وسلم, would have told Sayyid ibn thabit that for you not having prostrated was wrong you should have prostrated so it's sunnah the author he says well mustami' it's sunnah for the one who's reciting and also for the mustami' the mustami' is the one who intends to listen to the quran who is actually attentively listening, intending, having the intention to do so. Not the one who is a Sami'ah. Sami'ah, as the author mentions, Duna Sami'ah, that the Sami'ah doesn't have to prostrate because the Sami'ah is the one who is not intending to listen. He just happens to pass by the recitation or happens to be in the place where the Quran is being read and he hears that recitation. In Bukhari, Uthman radiallahu anhu is reported to have said, إِنَّمَا سَجْتَةُ عَلَى مَنْ اسْتَمَعَهَا that verily the sajda is upon one who was attentively listening, who intended to listen to the Qur'an, to the verses. So it's recommended, highly recommended for the one who is reciting, okay, and also for the one who is mustami', the one who is listening, not for the sami', not for the one who is uh, not intending to listen. The author, he says, وَإِن لَمْ يَسْجُدْ الْقَارِئَ لَمْ يَسْجُدْ that if the uh, one who is reciting doesn't make the sujood, then the one who is listening doesn't make the sujood. Okay? فَإِذَا لَمْ يَسْجُدُ الْأَصْلِ لَمْ يَسْجُدُ الْفَاسِدَةِ Because the asl, the foundation, is the one who is reciting. So if that person doesn't recite, then the far, the branch, the branch of who is the listener, doesn't also recite. It's like the qari, the reciter is the imam. So the one who is listening follows the imam. If the imam doesn't make the sujood, then the one who is listening, uh, uh, the mustami' also doesn't make the sujood. Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayyah, he mentions that if the one who is reciting is a few rows behind you, if the one who is reciting is a few rows behind you and he makes the sujood a tilawa and you are, of course, a few rows ahead, then you don't make the sujood a tilawa. He says it's because you're the, that person, as we mentioned briefly just now, is like the imam. So if the imam is behind you, it doesn't make sense. You can't follow him. Whereas if he was in front of you or beside you, you could have followed him. So this is something that some of the Hanbali scholars, they mentioned that if the one who's reciting is behind you and you heard the verse and you were listening attentively, then you don't make the prostration because the person is supposed to be like your imam in front of you or beside you and in this situation he's behind you so you don't make the prostration. The author he says, وَهُوَ أَرْبَعَ أَشْرَةَ سَجْدَةً And the, uh, the prostrations of tilawa, the prostrations, the Quranic prostrations are 14. Okay, there are 14 prostrations in the Quran. I'll read them to you briefly. Uh, the first of them is Surah Al-A'raf. The second of them is Al-Ra'ad. The third of them is Al-Nahal. The fourth of them is, is Al-Isra. The fifth of them, Maryam. The sixth and seventh, because there's two in this surah, is Al-Hajj. And the eighth of them, Al-Furqan. The ninth, Al-Namal. The tenth, Al-Sajda. The eleventh, Fusilat. The twelfth, Najm. The thirteenth, Al-Inshiqaq. The fourteenth, Al-Alaq. The author, he says, في الحج منها إثنتان As we just mentioned, in Surah Al-Hajj, there are two prostrations, Quranic prostrations. He says, وَيُكَبِّرُ إِذَا سَجَدَ That before you go into sujood, you make takbir. 
وَإِذَا رَفْعَ You make takbir. So be, when you go into the takbir, into the sujood, you make takbir. When you come up from the sujood, you make takbir. وَيَجْلِسُ وَيُسَلَّمْ And then you sit, and then you make taslim. And of course, the sitting is something which is recommended for the person who is not in the prayer. If you're making this recitation whilst in the salah, whilst in the prayer, then after having done the prostration, then you should get up immediately to go back to your recitation of the rak'ah that you were in. However, if you are sitting and not in your salah, then it's recommended that you sit after the prostration and then you make the taslim and there's no tashahat, there's no atahayyatu, which should have been done. Okay. So the author, he says, وَيُكْرَهُونَ لِلْإِمَامِ قِرَاءَةُ سَجْدَةٍ فِي صُلَاةِ سِرٍ وَسَجُورُهُ فِيهَا It's disliked for the imam to make a prostration, a Quranic prostration, sajood tilawa, in the salawat, which are sir, which are um, silent prayers, okay? It's not, it's disliked for the imam to recite or sorry, to, or it could be recite, to uh, make a prostration of uh, sajda tilawa uh, in the silent prayers. Why is that? Why do you think that is the case? Why is it disliked for the imam to make sajda tilawa in the silent prayers? Now. The followers uh, would not know if there was a barrier between the imam and the imam. Barakallah feek, exactly. So it will confuse the followers, right? If they're not close to the Imam, if they cannot see and figure out exactly why the Imam is prostrating, they may think the Imam is prostrating out of mistake and this will cause confusion, etc. And also Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, Hafidullah, he mentioned that it, was, it wasn't reported from the companions or from the Prophet وسلم, that they made a prostration of this type in the uh, silent prayers. Jazakallah khair. Also a point to mention that the ma'moom, if the imam, he does make a prostration of sujood tilawa then the imam, he has the choice whether to follow or not. Why? Because he himself is not reciting, neither is he listening to the verse. He's not reciting the verse, so it's not upon him to make sujood tilawa nor is he listening to the verse, so it's not upon him to make sujood tilawa either. And also they say because the imam has done something makruh. So the effect of having done something makru is that the ma'moom, the follower, has a choice whether to follow in that prostration or not to follow in that prostration. The author, he says, However, in other than the silent prayers, it's obligatory, it's incumbent upon the ma'moom, the follower, to follow his imam in that, in that prostration. إِذَا سَجَدَ الْإِمَامِ فِي صَلَاةِ لِجَهْرِيَّةِ فَيَجِبُ عَلَى الْمَأْمُونَ مُتَابِعَةُ فِيهَا الصَّحِيحِ As we said, the author mentioned clearly that it, the uh, Imam, he makes this prostration outside in, in, a, in a loud prayer. Then hereupon, it's incumbent upon the Ma'moon to follow in that prostration. Ibn Qadama, may Allah have mercy upon him, one of the Imams of the Madhab, he goes against the official position and he says that you should make it in all of the prostrations, whether the Imam did it in the uh, silent prostration or the Imam does it in the loud prostration. Can you remember an evidence that we've mentioned many times in the Kitab Salah as to what he based this opinion on? That he's saying that whether the Imam makes the prostration in the silent prayer or the loud prayer, then you as a follower, as a ma'moom, should prostrate with the Imam. What is the evidence? for this opinion of Imam Ibn Qudama. May Allah have mercy upon him. Is it because the uh, Imam is to be followed? Sahih, exactly. The generality of the hadith with the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامِ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ That very the Imam has been made to follow. فَإِذَا كَبَّرَ فَكَبِّرُ Okay, so if he makes takbir, you make takbir. وَإِذَا رَكَعَ فَرْكَعُ And if he makes ruku, you make ruku. وَإِذَا سَجَدَ فَاسْجُدُ and if you make sujood, then you make sujood. So due to the generality of that hadith, uh, Ibn Qudama and others held that opinion. But as we said, the author's opinion and the madhab's opinion is the differentiation that we mentioned. The author, he says, well, يُسْتَحَبُّ sujood shukr And it's recommended to do the sujood a shukr Sujood a shukr the sujood of thankfulness, uh, the prostration of thankfulness done 
uh, when somebody receives good news about something or somebody receives news of having been saved from a harm or something of that nature. So whenever the person receives good news or whenever the person is saved from some harm or something of that nature, then sujood shukr is to be done. And the Abi Dawood and uh, Ahmed, they narrate from Abi Bakr, Abi Bakra, not Abi Bakr, Abi Bakra, that uh, it's mentioned about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if good news was mentioned to him or if good news happened to him himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he would immediately fall into prostration out of thankfulness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it's something which is highly recommended and the author he mentions a further detail in the tajaddudi na'm wa in difa' al-niqm this is done when a blessing is upon you but he mentions an important point he said tajaddud al-ni'm the, the a new blessing is done upon you so it's not like for example if somebody's happily married to his wife right so when he got married he prostrated out of thankfulness. And then 10 years later, she dresses up for him and he's so happy, he makes prostration again. Uh, no, because that is a bounty which has been continual. It's referring to bounties which are new, new bounties. So for example, from the marriage, you had a newborn child, okay? You made uh, this sajjata shukr. When the child grows up and memorizes Quran, you make sajjata shukr. So every time the bounty, there's a new bounty or something that you've been saved from, that's when you make Sajdat al right? We mentioned that. And its, uh, it's uh, description, the Sajdat al Shukr, is the same as Sajdat al exactly the same as the Sujood of prostration. Okay? Uh, the author he says, Tab bihi salatu ghayri jahlin wa nasin. That if you are praying and you think of a bounty and then you make sujood al-shukr whilst you are praying, then your salah is going to be invalid, okay? Unless the person was ignorant of the fact that he was doing it, he was forgetful or he was ignorant of the ruling, okay? So why is this the case? Why is it the case based upon last week's lesson that if you do this sajda, then you are going to have invalidated your prayer unless it was forgetful. Tayyib the reason it becomes invalid is because the person is doing an action which is extra on purpose, right? So if you do an extra action on purpose in the salah, then the salah becomes uh, invalid. You do an extra pillar, then the salah will be invalidated. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We'll stop here inshallah. And uh, anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan. I ask Allah azza wa jal to make our reward even more than it normally would be because we're doing this in the month of Ramadan. And I ask Allah that he keeps us and our loved ones safe from the coronavirus and to make this Ramadan a special Ramadan for us. To make this Ramadan, though we have all these restrictions and our support mechanisms of going to the masjid and not being able to visit family members and friends have been taken away from us, we can still show to Allah that we are able to make this a special Ramadan. Ameen. If you have any questions uh, on the topic, then feel free, inshallah, before I go and take... A quick five minute nap. So if you have any questions, feel free.